before I have you turn to a passage with me this morning, I, I want you to think about a, a scenario. And before we do that, let's just ask the Lord's blessing on our time in the Word this morning. Father, we want to thank you for the truth that we've been able to sing this morning, that you are with your entire church, you are with us as individuals, that it is not death to die. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins and for the eternal life that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, as we come to your word, we pray your blessing that you would feed us, nourish us, teach us, convict us, sanctify us by your truth. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So imagine for a moment that in God's providence, you meet a scared, um, bitter, angry man. Over time, as you get to know him, he begins to share his story with you. And he tells you some of the details of what's been going on in his life in recent years. And it's not a particularly pretty picture. He tells you, I worked for a guy in this other city. This guy said he was a Christian. And sometimes I I was even around his Bible studies in his house where other people were gathered over and they would sing and they would pray and they would talk about Jesus, but I wanted nothing of it. I thought it was pretty weird. I've been through some stuff myself and, and all I could really think about was getting away from that scene, getting away from that boss. I mean... He was a good guy and all, but I was pretty messed up, and I ended up taking stuff from him, and I couldn't stay, and so here I am. And as you get to know this guy, you share with him what it actually means to be a believer, to be a Christian, to tell him more about what that, the faith of his boss was like. You tell him that the holy God who made him was justly angry with his sin, his his sin of robbing his boss, neglecting his responsibilities, and yet in love, God sent his only begotten son, the Jewish Messiah, to become human so that he could pay the penalty for your sin instead of you, and if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you for all the ways that you've broken God's holy law, he will save you and make you a part of his family and help you to live in a completely different way. And as you share the gospel message with him over time, you see the Holy Spirit graciously melt away his bitterness and his resistance You see his heart changing as you are talking with him. And what a joy to have the privilege of seeing him come to saving faith. Well, it was about 60 AD, and this is the testimony of Onesimus, the runaway slave. Now, it was a number of years ago, uh, quite a few years ago, that I, I preached the book of Philemon. And I have taken this material different places to youth retreats and even to the Life Enrichment Center. But recently my mind was drawn back to this book, and it's not my intention to preach through it again, but my mind was drawn back to this book because I've been spending time in it. And the, the, uh, those at Arbor Church who are in the greenhouse who have been studying together theology and practical application, we have just started a book called Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands a book by Paul Tripp about how every believer, to some extent, is called to help, to help others, to minister to others. Yes, with varying levels of ability and skill, but taking the knowledge of the Word of God that we have and the experience of walking with Him that is ours, to be able to encourage, exhort, help those around us with the help of the Word and by the help of the Holy Spirit. 
So the book of Philemon records this opportunity that the Apostle Paul had to minister both to Onesimus and to his owner, Philemon. Very complicated situation. And what I want us to do is I want us to take a look at the book of Philemon and see it as something of a, of a model in this case. What I want to do for uh, just a brief study, maybe two or three is all we'll take for this, but I want us to see this as um, a model, Paul's model really of, of helping others. Now in this book of Philemon, you can go ahead and turn there. The book of Philemon is actually Paul writing to Philemon and ministering in a sense to him but it shows us the backdrop of Paul having already ministered to Onesimus. And now Paul is actually going to be used of the Lord to help in the relationship between Philemon and Onesimus. But as I said, as we look at this book, I want us to do it, uh, take a rather quick look at this book and look at it as a model of helping others, a model of ministry. So what we're going to do is we're going to see what can we learn from Paul when it comes to helping others, especially in the difficult circumstances, the thorny situations of life. This is certainly one of them. Now, the, the book of Philemon is just this one chapter. I'm going to take a moment to read it for you, and uh, then we're going to begin to take a look at, at it as a, an example or a pattern of Paul's way of ministering. Did you find it? It's kind of small, isn't it? (laughs) All right. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Aphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, Being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You, therefore, receive him, that is, my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you? both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay. Not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord." Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. I wonder if you've ever found yourself as a believer in a situation where someone comes to you and they unload a very thorny, complicated, difficult situation. Maybe your response is to have them talk to a pastor or a counselor, and that's not always a bad thing. 
But if we were honest, there are many times where this is as far as it's going to go, and if they get help, it's gonna be from you, at least for now. And how complicated can situations be? We were talking the other night in the greenhouse about how we have a tendency when it comes to helping others, uh, first of all, we have a tendency to wanna just fix them or just fix the problem. And that often is not even in our ability. Other times, as much as we consider ourselves to be a people of the word, it's almost like I think we want to try to help out, but, but kind of bypassing God or forgetting the reality that this is the living God who is at work in this situation. There are so many ways that we tend to try to want to take back the control of the situation and solve it through human ingenuity. So what I want us to be encouraged with right from the start here as we take a fresh look at this book of Philemon through the eyes of a, of a, of a helper, I want us to remember that the foundation of this ministering to one another is remembering that it's the Holy Spirit who is at work in the midst of people's lives. God has chosen to use us as tools or as instruments in the Redeemer's hands, as Paul Tripp's book is entitled. But we need to be careful to remember that the the foundation of this kind of ministry is God is at work here, and so we want to use not only theological truth and biblical truth, but we want to remember that the living, active God who made us and saved us is bringing this opportunity (laughs) to do something. He's doing something. And it's the active, living God who is at work. And I would have to say in my own testimony as as a pastor that I don't know that I have ever felt more helpless or kind of like I've come to the end of my own abilities than in the counseling room. Because people's situations and people's sins and the complications that come often very quickly make us remember that apart from God, we can't really substantially bring about the kind of change that's needed just by some tips and tricks and some helpful ideas, but rather it's the regenerating and sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. The very power that raised Christ from the dead is what is needed here in this situation. And if you've ever felt like you're just not up to this thing, You're not alone, first of all. But I want you to think about this situation for a minute. Paul was most likely, as we study the life of Paul, he's most likely living under house arrest in Rome when he writes this book. Onesimus has found his way to Paul somehow in God's providence. And Onesimus comes to faith under Paul's ministry But back in Colossae, Philemon continues on, worshiping with the Colossian church that met in his house. And now Paul was in a situation where he was going to be used of God to try to bring about some form of reconciliation between Onesimus, the runaway slave, and Philemon, the Christian owner. If that doesn't sound complicated enough right there. Now let's take a few moments and think about the complication of this cultural situation. I'm going to just tell you from the outset, I don't consider myself to be an expert in these things. A lot of what I'm going to say, I'm simply going to pass along what I've studied, and I'm not going to profess to have all of the answers. But I want you to appreciate uh, a little bit of the complication of the situation that Paul is attempting to face. So we're going to take kind of an extended time this morning to look at the situation. And by the way, if you have an opportunity to minister to someone, um, you're going to probably do the same thing. You're going to take some time to get to know the person, to get to know the situation, to ask appropriate questions, and to make sure you're dealing with the actual thing that needs to be dealt with. We don't want to jump to conclusions in in, in our effort to fix the situation. So let's take a few moments to consider the complication of what Paul was facing. We know certainly that uh, in America's history and throughout history, slavery is a complicated and a volatile issue. 
Think with me for a moment about slavery under the Roman Empire. Uh, Slavery has been around a lot throughout history. It's unfortunately been a part of many civilizations, and in some cases, it's been very much a part of the fabric and foundation of the economy of certain societies. There are some estimates that there were up to 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire that perhaps as much at certain times, as much of a third of the Roman Empire was made up of slaves. It is said that there were some proprietors or businessmen that owned as many as 20,000. And in that day, it was taken for granted as just a normal part of life. That's unfortunate, but the whole structure of Roman society was based on it. Marvin Vincent said, slavery grew with the growth of the Roman state until it changed the economic basis of society, doing away with free labor and transferring nearly all industries to the hands of slaves. So for a time in history during the Roman Empire, free labor was not always an option that you could choose as a businessman. It wasn't as common at this point. It's a horrible result of war and man's greed and selfish ambition and other things, but that was the reality. That was the time in which they lived. Now, during times of war, most of those slaves would have been captives, but by Paul's day, most of those slaves were actually just born into slavery. And this got complicated. You know, some slaves were treated like family. Some slaves were treated cruelly. But the the cold reality is that they were considered property that could be sold, exchanged, given away, seized in order to pay a master's debt. Roman slaves had no legal right to marriage, so slave cohabitation was regulated by their masters. Now, a master could free a slave, or a slave could buy his freedom if he could raise the money, But for a case of a runaway slave like that of Onesimus, Roman law actually gave almost complete control of slaves into the hands of the masters. So Philemon would have had the say over Onesimus' fate. Sometimes runaway slaves or criminal slaves were branded with an F on their heads for fugitive. Sometimes they were beaten. Sometimes they were condemned to double labor. Sometimes they were put to death, such as being thrown to the beasts in the amphitheater. Well, as a runaway slave, Onesimus was a criminal. And Paul's mention in the book of Onesimus owing Philemon money may be just a reference to the fact that Onesimus was depriving Philemon of his services, but it also may mean that Onesimus stole in other ways as well in his departure. So you can see, even though Philemon is a man of faith and a man with a good Christian testimony, you can see why Philemon's heart attitude and disposition toward Onesimus right now was of the utmost importance. Now, by the time of Paul... Slavery had improved, the conditions of it had, partially because masters came to realize that contented slaves work better, just pragmatic. And although not recognized legally as persons, they did begin to acquire some legal rights. So in AD 20, just to put that in perspective, that's about the time that, you know, um, uh, Zach Ashley or Josiah Woodman, you know, it's about the time Jesus would have been about their age. We don't know much about his life at that point, but but when Jesus was about 20, the Roman Senate decreed that slaves accused of crimes were to be tried in the same manner as free men. And in some cases, their wills were recognized as valid, and they were often permitted to own property, so things were changing. Now, here's what's ironic, and again, I'm just stating what I've read. I'm not passing a judgment on this trying to explain it even. But at this time, slaves were often better off than freemen. You know, at least they were assured of food, clothing, shelter, while poor freemen often slept in the streets or in cheap housing. Freemen had no job security and could lose their livelihood in hard economic times, 
whereas some slaves actually ate and dressed every bit as much as well as freemen. And during this period, slaves could be doctors, musicians, teachers, artists, librarians, accountants. It was not uncommon for a Roman to train a slave at his own trade. Makes sense, right? I mean, have them do what you do. So they had opportunities for education and training in almost all disciplines. And by the first century now, and so we're talking about this time, of the time of Paul and Philemon around 60 AD, by the first century, freedom was a real possibility for many slaves, and some owners used it as incentive for the slaves to work better. But also, many slaves had deep friendships with their owners and would not have taken freedom even if it had been offered because their situation was safer and happier and more beneficial as, as uh, undesirable in some ways as it, would be, as it is. Um, it actually was almost more to their advantage to stay where they were because they were, would be more vulnerable trying to go it on their own. So it got to the point where some masters actually even designated in their wills that their slaves would be freed or receive part of the estate after the master's death. And so it's kind of a complicated situation that at times could actually be more, you know, almost familial you know, having to do with family. Well, there's one study indicated that in the period from 81 to 49 BC, which was now you know, 50 years plus before Christ was born, that 500,000 slaves were freed in the Roman Empire. And under Augustus Caesar, so many slaves were being freed upon the death of their owners that a law had to be passed restricting that practice. So it, it was a time of great change when it comes to, to those things. They're from the, the century before Christ was born and the century after Christ was born. A lot of things were changing regarding slavery in the Roman Empire. Some people might legitimately ask, well, then does the Bible encourage slavery? Because you certainly see at times it regulates it. it there are safeties built in, you know, even in the nation of Israel. Uh, or to put it another way, you know, some people ask, why didn't Paul demand emancipation for Onesimus? Because he doesn't. He, he, he doesn't really, I mean, not, at least not really directly and outwardly, although I, I would make a case that he kind of sort of does push for that in the way that he exhorts Philemon to receive Onesimus back as a brother in Christ, as more than a slave. I think there's a sense in which Paul is beginning to address that issue, but from the heart. I think the reason that Paul doesn't demand emancipation outrightly from a social perspective is really a combination of wisdom, grace, and even purpose with what he's trying to accomplish. I mean, think about what would have happened if Paul had demanded that all the slaves be set free. I mean, he could have provoked utter chaos and widespread massacre, especially if you try to bring about change that doesn't affect the heart. It could actually have been quite dangerous for a lot of people. The Roman government, you know, most likely, if you look at the way things often went, they would have violently crushed any insurrection and hundreds or thousands of slaves would have been killed. And as I said, kind of a, the complication of it all, some relationships between master and slave were such that it was a, a workable social institution, even if it wasn't an ideal one. And some people might have even wondered what the huge problem was. Certainly in other cases, those who had been treated cruelly would have had a heart to push for some sort of reform, for sure. There's also, I think, the danger, because one thing you see from the Apostle Paul is that for him, it's always about the cross. It's always about the message of Jesus Christ. It's always about the gospel and what God is doing in building his kingdom. And he's not going to put the cart before the horse, so to speak. And so Paul doesn't want the message of the gospel to be swallowed up, I believe, by the message of social reform, which could quickly become the point, you know, the case, if, if that became the primary message. So I think what Paul was doing is, you know, just really what the theology of Christianity is going to do is Paul is sowing the seeds of the destruction of slavery by teaching what it means to actually be brothers in Christ. 
But instead of doing this, accomplishing this through social reform, Paul is actually going after hearts. (laughs) He's going after Philemon's heart in this matter. So Paul doesn't order Philemon to free Onesimus, and he doesn't tell Philemon that owning slaves is a sin. I'm not making a judgment. I'm just stating the fact here in the book of Philemon. That's the way it is. But he does encourage Philemon to receive Onesimus as a brother, and in so doing, Paul is beginning to eliminate the abuses of slavery. Because when you think about it, as you you eliminate the abuses of slavery, you're on the way to eliminating slavery. But the significant point, I think, from Paul and other New Testament writers is that God is more concerned with changing the heart than simply the outward behavior. Here's why. You cannot change only the heart, but you can change only the outward behavior. In other words, if the heart changes, the life will change and Christ will be glorified. But if behavior changes, but not the heart, a person can actually be worse off than before, lifted up in morality and self-righteousness while actually bypassing God's work in their lives. You know, if you feel like you can be moral and effective without God's help, well, that's kind of what self-righteous people do. Now, just to be clear, I'm not advocating that in any way that slavery is a good thing. What I've been trying to do is to just show this is what life was like in Paul's day, and this was the context within which Paul had to try to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to both Onesimus, the runaway slave, and Philemon, the Christian slave owner living in Colossae. Some people might ask, why would Philemon own any slaves? And he's a Christian, isn't he? And As I said, I think the complicated answer would be, I'm not sure there were always a lot of options in the culture of Rome at that time. And if you had a business or if you had things you were going to do, that's simply the way it was. Doesn't make it right, but it's what Paul was dealing with. So I've mentioned that Paul was writing this letter to Philemon while he was in Rome in prison around AD 60. So From what we can tell, especially as you compare the book of Colossians with the book of Philemon, it looks to us like the Colossian believers actually met in Philemon's house. And what's what's really ironic, and we don't know for sure, and I I don't want to go way out on a limb here, but when you compare Colossians and Philemon, it's actually a very likely scenario that this letter from Paul to Philemon was actually carried to the Colossians, to Philemon, at the hand of Tychicus and Onesimus. It's very possible, I would even say likely, that Onesimus actually brought this letter from Paul to Philemon himself. And without having a way you know, to call or to email and give him a heads up, Onesimus must have been kind of shaken in his boots, or or maybe he's like, Tychicus here, (laughs) you take it, I'm going to stay back 50 yards or so, and you kind of let him see it first, and then I'll kind of come in from around the corner or something. I'm just making that up, the Bible doesn't say any of that, but you know, these guys are human, right? Well, the Apostle Paul in this letter describes himself as a, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, Philemon from the book Just to give us a little synopsis here of of what we're talking about, Um, most likely he's a businessman in the church in Colossae who was wealthy enough to own at least one slave and a house that was big enough to have worship services. So he seems to be a man of some means. He was known as a man of hospitality and love for the saints. And so it seemed like he had uh, a certain amount that the Lord had gifted him with by ability and stewardship. The implication in the book of Philemon is that Paul had actually been instrumental in Philemon's conversion, perhaps while Paul was ministering in Ephesus. And you don't get the idea that they had a long established personal intimate history spending you know, time together shoulder to shoulder, but Paul had been used in Philemon's life in his conversion. They did have a brotherly love for one another, but I don't know that Paul had been by Colossae at all, certainly not any time recently. Onesimus, as we've already said, was Philemon's runaway slave, 
hiding in Rome from charges that probably included theft and might have been looking at the death penalty. It certainly was an option with all of that power being in Philemon's hands. But as we've already seen, God had mercy on him. And somehow in God's providence, he found the apostle Paul in Rome and he found the Lord Jesus Christ by God's grace. So you can tell now that having been converted, there's something in Onesimus that says you need to go back, you need to make restitution, you need to repent of any sin that you've committed and make things right with Philemon, but he was scared to go back because of what he had done. So Paul is writing this letter to kind of pave the way for Philemon to receive Onesimus back into his household and and into the Colossian church. You know, this, this situation actually is is bigger than some. Sometimes in certain situations, you just have one person dealing with another person and the matter is quite quiet. But in this case, everyone in the church would have known about Onesimus. And when, when Paul writes this book, and like I said, it probably came with the book of Colossians as well. So Paul is writing one book to the whole church in Colossae, and those things were going to be shared with other believers in Hierapolis and Laodicea. Well, here in this book, he actually writes it to Philemon, but also to Aphia, Archippus, and to the church (laughs) that meets in Philemon's house. So in this particular case, because the knowledge of Onesimus' situation was yay big, Paul was going to address it yay big, and so all of the people in the church that knew about it were going to hear what Paul was saying to Philemon, so they would be instructed by this too. They are getting an example of how to address this in a Christ-like way. So it's in this situation that Paul is called to be faithful both to Onesimus, who had been there in person, and to Philemon, who was being written by letter. You know, some people might ask, well, how does Paul know about Philemon if he hadn't really spent a lot of time with him recently? Without going into a lot of detail, first of all, you have Onesimus who was there, and Onesimus knew Philemon. You also have a man named Epaphras who seems to have come to Paul from the church in Colossae, and he most likely would have had a lot of intimate knowledge about Philemon as well. So between Onesimus and Epaphras, They played a huge part in conveying to Paul Philemon's character and his testimony and his heart because you see Paul interacting with that and responding to that here in the letter. So what we're going to do then, and we're just going to begin this morning because I wanted to give that extended background and introduction because I think it's helpful sometimes to remember... um, that the Bible addresses real situations and to kind of take it out of the realm of, uh, you know, just quickly moving past a few facts that we're very familiar with. So what we want to do is we want to ask, what are the lessons from the book of Philemon that are to be learned concerning helping others, ministering to others? As Paul Tripp puts it as a subtitle in his book, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands, he says, people in need of change, helping people in need of change. And so, yes, Paul, in this case, was an apostle. He was a gifted man of God. He was a preacher, a church planner, a church strengthener, a writer of a lot of the New Testament by the Holy Spirit. And yet, he, there are lessons for us, for those of us who would have opportunity to interact with brothers and sisters after a morning worship service or at small group. There are lessons for us to learn about how to minister to one another that we can learn from the Apostle Paul's interactions with Philemon. Paul was a man in need of change, called to help two brothers in Christ in need of change. So what we're going to begin doing this morning, and then next time as well, is we're going to look at these lessons for ministering to one another. Usually when we minister to one another in a specific situation, there's an issue, right? Something happened or a brother or a sister is struggling with a particular thing and it's around that thing or that situation or that event or that dark providence that grace needs to be ministered. In this case, it was Onesimus going back as a converted person to a, frankly, to a man who had never known him as a believer. Philemon did not know Onesimus the Christian. 
And so this was a very real, very interesting situation. So lesson number one, what can we learn from Paul in ministering to others by his example in the book of Philemon? Well, Paul assured Philemon of his love. That's number one. Paul assured Philemon of his love. At the very beginning of the letter, Paul addresses Philemon as a beloved friend and fellow laborer. And you can tell from other language in the book as well that Paul feels a certain love. He has a a love, a Christian love for Philemon, his brother in Christ. You've probably heard the the adage, the saying, but it's true, and it's kind of catchy so it sticks with you, that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And there's an element of truth to that. It's not scripture, but there's an element of truth to that, isn't there? You can be speaking truth, but if you're speaking it coldly or with arrogance or outside of the context of a relationship, a lot of times people don't really care what you have to say. But we're taught, aren't we, to speak the truth in love. And if people know that they're loved, they know that they're being cared for, They know that our desires in meeting with them is not selfish ambition or trying to build my own kingdom or get an advantage from them, but they know rather that my greatest heart's desire is to love them, to show the love of Christ to them, and to do what will cause their souls to thrive. They'll uh, They'll be very likely to listen to what it is that we have to say. As we said, Paul doesn't seem to have spent a lot of time with Philemon recently, or or perhaps ever, but he had been instrumental in his conversion, and in Christ, Paul loved him as a brother, as a friend, and as a fellow laborer in God's kingdom. Have you ever heard someone's testimony, someone that you didn't even know or you barely knew, but as you hear of their love for Christ, you kind of start loving them? (laughs) Now, that's what was happening here. When you hear of someone's faith in Christ, someone's love for the saints, how they're pouring themselves out in the kingdom, you may not even know them and you can almost sense a love in your heart for them because of the fellowship that you have in Christ in his kingdom. Now, there's another reason why this is really significant. You know how there's a natural principle for us to feel close to the one who's right there in front of us? You know, to to have an affinity for the one that we know? It's why we're told, that's why we're told in Proverbs, the wisdom of Proverbs is, you know, make sure that you listen to the other side before you render judgment because it's easy to make a quick snap judgment based on the person in front of you, the person you're with right now, the person that you know. Well, the natural human response of many in this scenario would very likely have been to feel a closer connection with Onesimus because he's the one who's there with Paul in person and based on the text had been ministering to him and encouraging him in prison as a new believer in Christ. Paul had a very strong and present love for Onesimus, the one who had been such an encouragement to him, not only coming to faith, but being there ministering to him under house arrest. It would have been very easy for Paul to pretty much come at this thing from Onesimus' side and maybe be unbalanced in the way he handled things. But Paul doesn't do that because he's not about his own advantage. He's an experienced gospel laborer. And so you see Paul here um, dwelling in the realm of truth and love with both of these guys, not just with Onesimus. So Paul didn't let the reality of this situation alienate him from Philemon because Philemon was also a beloved brother in Christ. There was no reason for Paul to feel like he had to be only on Onesimus' side. Philemon's testimony was that as a faithful brother and a minister and a a man of hospitality and a, a leader of some sort in the church in Colossae. And so Paul was led by the Holy Spirit and by principle, not by convenience and circumstance. So he shows love, wisdom, and grace to Onesimus, 
also telling Onesimus hard things, like you need to go back. And he deals with Philemon with wisdom and love and grace, even though Philemon was not around. Well, when you and I are in a position to help people in their walk with Christ, it's important to see them as brothers and sisters in Christ and children of the Heavenly Father. In other words, see them relationally. See them as one that has been brought into the kingdom by God himself, one that God loves and is shepherding with his care. You know, see that brother or sister as one in whom God is doing a work, and here is an opportunity for that work. It's not about me. It's not about my skill, my prowess, my ability to fix it. God is, is bringing this opportunity about to use me as a tool or an instrument in what God is doing in this situation. So remember, it's God's family. It's God's kingdom. This is a brother or sister in Christ, and I'm just a part of this thing by God's grace, doing what God has in the moment called me to do. If the person is not a believer, then you might not say, well, they're, they're not a brother or sister in Christ, but I can still love them like Christ loved the lost. And minister to them with that same kind of heart. But we want to guard against seeing them as projects or something to be fixed. I'm simply a tool in the hands of the living God who is the one doing the work. So the first lesson about ministering to others from the book of Philemon is Paul assured Philemon of his love. And it was genuine and it was real. Secondly, Paul established the principle that God was personally at work in Philemon's life. Paul established the principle to Philemon that Paul was aware that people understood and that it was true that God was personally at work in Philemon's life. You see that particularly in verses 4 through 6 where Paul says, I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm not going to dwell there like I did when I preached through Philemon, but just to recap or to mention that uh, what Paul is recognizing here, I believe, is first of all faith in Christ, that Philemon had been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, that he had been justified through faith, declared not guilty in Jesus. He had been adopted into God's family. And the testimony of Philemon was that he was continuing to live in faith. He was continuing as one who was a Christ follower. He had faith, and faith evidenced itself. Paul also says that he heard of his love for the saints, that agape kind of love, which is an intentional, sacrificial, humble giving of yourself to others for their spiritual good. That was Philemon's testimony. That he had faith in Christ that was genuine and it evidenced itself in godly works and in a heart of love and ministry to the saints. And part of Paul's prayer here in verse 6 is that I'll, I'll reword it, that the sharing springing from your faith may be energetically stimulated by the clear recognition of all the good that is ours in Christ Jesus. Paul says we share this fellowship in the gospel. So what is Paul doing here? Well, part of what he's doing here is he's trying to encourage Philemon and remind Philemon that God was personally the one who was at work in Philemon's life. This was more than Paul. This was not just the Apostle Paul. This was God himself who was doing this work, saving Philemon, sanctifying Philemon, working in Philemon's heart for what, was about to, what, was, for what Paul was about to tell Philemon was about to happen. But you know, it must have been encouraging for Philemon to hear someone like the Apostle Paul say to him, Philemon, from what I know of you and from what these brothers have told me of you, here is what I know of your reputation. Here is what I know of your testimony. You have yielded yourself and your possessions to God's kingdom. 
You have yielded your house to be used for worship on a regular basis, which is not always an easy thing. And you use your very self, your being, your your gifts, your personality to refresh the saints. When someone is facing a, a difficult decision or situation like Philemon was about to face, it's helpful to remind them that God himself is at work in his life. That the faithful, covenant-keeping God of creation and salvation is at work in this situation. Well, those are the first two with that extended introduction. We'll continue on next time. I'm actually going to be um, out of the pulpit a few weeks uh, with vacation and then guest speakers. But when we come back, we're going to continue looking at these lessons about how to minister to one another from the example of Paul to Philemon. This morning, we've seen that Paul assured Philemon of his love and established the principle that God was personally at work in Philemon's life. And what we'll see is Paul moves from from that foundation to some of the actual exhortations and things that we've already read in the book, some kind of difficult things that he's going to have to exhort Paul to do. Let's pray. I'm sorry, he's going to have to exhort Philemon to do. Our Father, as we take this particular look at the book of Philemon so that we can be instructed by Paul's wisdom and Paul's heart, we pray, Lord, that you would stir up our hearts and our minds to be used in a similar way. Lord, our desire is to not just be instructed after Paul's pattern, But Lord, that you would also be working in our own hearts and lives so that we would be ready and willing to be used. Maybe even here, Lord, in a few minutes after this morning's service. Maybe in a vehicle on the way to Edgewood Baptist Church this afternoon. Or maybe later on in a personal interaction or small group or some other setting. But Lord, help us to be those that are willing, wherever we are in our walk with you, whatever our current level of Bible knowledge is, Lord, may we be those who are in tune with your spirit, with what you are doing in your kingdom, with what your desires are for our lives as you revealed that to us in your holy word. And Lord, make us more knowledgeable of your word, but Lord, make us also willing to share, to minister, to help, Brothers and sisters, Lord, who who may need to hear things they already know, but they need a word of encouragement or a word of exhortation or a confirmation concerning how they're trying to follow you. Lord, may we be that kind of people. May we have those kinds of relationships where, Lord, the, the word of God is open often. And as we speak with one another, Lord, we're showing real Christian love to one another in the things that we say and do. And not just things that people want to hear, but things that are good for one another to hear, even when sometimes that's hard. So help us, Lord, to follow after Paul's example and to follow after his heart and his theology, Lord, that you would help us as we help others. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.